Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Livia Labati and this is Where is Anne Lister? Where is Anne Lister? Should be a really easily, easily answerable question for someone whose body was painstakingly transported 4,000 kilometers over seven months to be returned home. And yet today we cannot visit Anne Lister's precise resting place. So during this session, we'll share a behind the scenes look at how we have been working together to uncover this mystery. You may be familiar with our findings to date through the article we've published uh, to document this ongoing work. Have you had a chance to read it? Uh, we have a little quiz to ask you if, um, if you have or have not had a chance to do that yet. If you want to take a second and uh, say yes or no, you want to get a sense of the room. Oh, look at that. Great, thank you so much for taking a moment to do that. All right, I think we're probably stabilized at a 59, 41%. Okay, great, that's wonderful. Uh, so no matter whether you've uh, heard it or not, or read or not, or any iteration of the article so far, um, given the complexity of the topic, we'll start with a brief overview of some of the findings so far. Then we're gonna transition to a discussion of the methods, approach, resources, and the work dynamics we've had to employ to get us here. While there are records of Anne's and Lister's funeral at the Halifax Minster, there is ambiguity about where in the church burial took place originally, as well as potential movement of the coffin within the church over the 180 years she's been there. This may seem surprising at first, but it's not really uncommon occurrence for a building of its, this kind with the history that it has. That's why when her gravestone was found in the year 2000, it was not where it was originally expected. So our intent is to find concrete evidence that helps us answer this question. So understanding this historical context is not only a foundation for how we've approached this research, but precisely what has provided us with critical clues about Anlister's likely whereabouts, as well as incidental findings we've made about Halifax, the Minster, and Anlister's family. So let's take a look at some of these things that came up during research. All right, so about 60% uh, of the room, I was just looking at the poll, um, has not read the article yet. And uh, there is a wealth of information in there. So after this, I encourage you all to definitely go check it out because we're definitely not gonna be able to fit everything into this session. Um, but some of the things that we wanted to highlight today and share with you are our experiences, learning about another child of Jeremy and Rebecca Listers, um, the revelation that change previously held beliefs as to the location of the Lister family vault, uh, being able to identify exactly which pews were used by uh, the Lister and Walker families, including those that they rented. Um, confirmation that not only did other gravestones like Anne's move during the Minster's history, but also learning that during various renovations, coffins and human remains were also relocated. Um, and then lastly, we'll discuss some modern non-invasive technologies that could be used uh, with respect to the Minster and uh, why some may be futile given what we know now is under that floor. So as we've become familiar with Ann Lister, um, we've also learned more about her immediate family and siblings, some of whom are also buried in the church. In 1789, John Lister was the first of her siblings to be interred there. And in 1810, Anne's second brother named John would also be laid to rest at the church. Uh, her brother Jeremy died in 1802 and was buried in Beverly. Her brother Samuel died in Ireland in 1813 and is buried in Fermoy, Ireland. And Anne's sister Marion is buried in the churchyard of the Church of St. Anne in the Grove in South Aram. So, however, one of the things that we discovered um, on this journey was while looking through various parish records and um, Jane, James Lister's notes on the family pedigree, we also found a mention of a burial for another sibling of Anne's, an infant and another sister who was recorded as being buried at the Halifax Parish Church on the 7th of April, 1806 which was uh, one of those unexpected, but certainly interesting finds that we came across. All right, so uh, one established belief at the time we started was the burial location uh, of the Listers, uh, uh, the location of the Lister vault uh, was formerly thought to be in the uh, Oldsworth Chapel, mainly thanks to this entry from Anne Lister's journal that says our burying place is in the south uh, chapel at the west end next to the constable's pew. 
So at the time, as far as we knew, and apparently it was common, uh, you could see a plan of the church, but you, apparently nobody had um, a plan with the, the pews marked. So the Old Swords Chapel is located at the south side of the church, uh, marked in that diagram. There's that fantastic photo from Chantel's uh, visit. Um, this is near the current entrance, uh, the south porch. So when you visit the church, you will enter it uh, through the south porch. Um, the Oldsworth uh, Chapel was built by Robert Oldsworth, who was vicar uh, of the Halifax Parish Church uh, in mid the mid-16th century, and the, the chapel was built according to his father's uh, wishes. This uh, is, uh, at the time, was a, a used as a chantry chapel, um, and uh, there's another chapel on the north side, which we are not going to touch here, but I encourage you to go and see, because it must be amazing. So, well, I fooled everyone for some time, and now moving on. Okay, so uh, I mentioned seating plans, and this was actually something that um, puzzled us for a while. Uh, we were uh, gathering information uh, for this project, and we came across a, an archival reference for a seating plan of the church uh, from the 1830s, which was cataloged as allegedly having been made for an lister. So we ordered a copy uh, to see how the church looked back then. And then, surprise, there were lister and Walker graves marked there. So everyone was very, very excited. Uh, and then we noticed small pencil markings uh, in pews. Uh, then we did some more. Um, magic with the image and we realized those were actually names of the people who, to whom those pews were rented uh, so we got a layer of information uh, that we did not expect first we just wanted to see how the church would look in terms of layout at the time and then all of a sudden surprise surprise you have a bunch of information coming at us so uh, one random night we we were uh, working on the journal and um, we came across this, this uh, snippet that you see here that says, at the sexton of the old church, the old church is actually the Halifax Parish Church, um, uh, had the sexton of the old church at eight, brought me a plan of church and a little book of text explanatory of the plan and giving me, uh, the inscriptions on the monuments for all which ask 20 shillings. Uh, sorry, I'm bad with money, uh, <laughs> not too much. So that plan is actually the one you see in this image. It's the 1835 plan that belonged to one lister. Uh, and we cannot claim uh, a rediscovery on this. This was actually our colleague, Jude Dobson, who visits the archives in the library uh, often uh, in search of stuff that interests everyone and anyone. So Jude uh, was, uh, went to the archive and she said what she always says, hey, do you need something? And we are like, yeah, sure, have a look at plans of the church, anything you think might be interesting. So she gets there, she unfurls the thing and surprise, here it is, the other one. So the first one that we came across was from 1836 and uh, the handwriting there is actually very similar to Ann Walker, so we think it might be a copy made either by or for Ann Walker then, that she then annotated, but the original from the sexton is very likely this one because it matches what's on the journal. So um, this one confirmed what we already su suspected and they had some confirmation from the other plan, um, which is the location of the Lister vault that looks like that big L um, near um, the top uh, left of the, of the plan. Uh, so most of the pencil notes coincides in both plans, though some pew rentals appear to have changed from the notes on this plan that you see in the image and the other one uh, that we came across um, before this one. So moving on. You muted, Amanda. Sorry. <laughs> Thank
So something that became um, apparent relatively quickly in this um, project was that the, um, the Halifax Parish Church had gone through some um, extensive periods of change throughout its long history. And we came across newspaper records from the 19th century that reported human remains becoming visible in the floors of the church, um, which had begun to cause a bit of a smell, as you can imagine. Um, this prompted an inquiry resulting in significant renovations um, in the years 1878 and 79. The resulting changes that were made to the church um, made it particularly difficult to track the placement of gravestones, especially as uh, in some of the renovations, floors of the church had to be fixed um, and therefore some of the gravestones were moved during these repairs. Uh, with these changes, uh, it's noted, and I quote from one of the newspaper articles, uh, the gravestones were all replaced as nearly as possible in the same position as before. But as some features like pews, memorials, galleries, and the organ were moved and removed in some cases, um, some of the stones traveled away from their original location, and in some instances were even broken and discarded. This could then be the reason why Amnesty's gravestone went missing for such a long period of time. Next slide. Okay, so at some point we started to realize that we would need um, we would need to to actually uh, start listing options, and then I would actually go over this and annotate. But Lydia, I don't have that option, so I'm going to ask you to follow me now. So first option that uh, was the main one when we started was actually the Oldsworth Chapel on the south side of the church which was where the Lister vault was thought to be. So that was the first thing that we started. This doesn't happen in, the va in a vacuum. So we, uh, we started where everyone starts. And then we started to, uh, to push against hypotheses and seeing how it holds in face of evidence. Uh, another uh, idea that was actually pioneered by a uh, local uh, historian, um, David Glover, was the location at north uh, of the the grave at the northwest corner of the of the church, which was uh, near the location where the, the stone uh, actually um, the fragments of the stone were uh, found in 2000. Then we started to think about the the Lister vault, and one of the things that actually pushed us towards a location in an aisle was Anne's description of the funeral of her, of her father, because. She is describing what happened when she attended the funeral. Uh, Livia, it's the big, the big L uh, on the south side, you're near it in, in green. Um, so yeah, uh, above. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, when Jeremy Lister was buried, Anne Lister mentions that the vicar stood on a pew. So why would you stand on a pew if you have space to actually do your thing? So that's the first thing that made us wonder Maybe it's on a, uh, an aisle and not necessarily in a, a place with room. And then when the plans uh, showed up, we realized that actually we had been uh, looking at it and many people had been looking at that uh, in a different way. In fact, the, some Lister stones are actually near this location on the church, which matches with uh, what we knew from the renovations in which the, the newspapers uh, report that many of the stones were uh, placed at or near the, uh, their original location. So this uh, was all verified by different um, elements uh, from evidence. And well, it's very, very likely that this is actually it and the plans corroborate that. So we don't really have um, any reason to doubt that Unless, of course, this is ongoing, so if any evidence comes to contradict us, that's fine. This is science. So another option was a grave near the Rokeby Chapel. Uh, there used to be an East Cross Isle there, and the plans include a listed grave there. Um, we don't know for sure who is buried there or why it was marked there. The plans don't include a pencil marking for that particular grave. So we don't know, we just know it exists there or it existed and that's it. Then uh, there's one, a grave at the Eastern end of the nave uh, near the font marked in green uh, in that diagram. 
which is what we usually call the LX grave. Uh, it's a curious uh, place for a grave. It's on the West Cross Isle, a place where you have space, but it's not uncommon because there are, uh, the, the floor of the church is very, very likely littered with graves of all sorts uh, of people and in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So another thing we thought about was the possibility of reusing a Walker grave because the Walkers, after the, William Walker died in 1809, they started to be buried at Lightcliffe. So uh, the Walker graves, at the Halifax Parish Church would be unused since at least that date. So by the time when Lister died, they could have reused some, but this is obviously just a theory because we don't like to discard options unless there is actual proof to say this is not such a great idea. One option that we haven't listed here, but, we, but remains on the article and we intend to maintain until something clearly disproves it, uh, is the possibility that um, uh, there was a, a reburial, not, not a burial, but a reburial at the, in the consecrated ground of the parish church's uh, churchyard, given that there was a document authorizing the renovations that also gave the people involved in that process the power to move coffins if they were detrimental to the renovations or in any way made it more complex and complicated, uh, they were authorized to move them. And uh, the only requirement was just to be a consecrated ground, uh, ground pres uh, preferably the churchyard or whatever. So let's move on. You're muted also, Chantal. <laughs> Oh, I even reminded myself. Um, okay, so one of our last key findings um, was why we may never know her actual location. Um, so this research uh, took me back to my undergrad days in structural geology, um, uh, doing all these various geotechnical work that, that, that I did at the time. So this was one of my favorite, favorite areas. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, so disrupting the church and its uh, use in the, the wider community uh, was not our goal with this research. Um, but in order to be thorough, we did ask the question of how could we find her um, if we did get to rely on modern technology. And there is a lot of technology out there for these kinds of things. Um, so I won't go into all the technical details here, um, but geotechnical surveys um, are used to locate things underground, such as graves, um, uh, water pipes, anything underground, like it can be used. Um, and it's used to do it non-invasively, right? So it gives you an idea what's underground before you start digging or if you can't dig. Um, and so this is used widely inside and outside of churches. Um, but one of the key things to note about using this technology um, is that most of the technology um, is used to locate graves in general. So it's not looking for specific graves um, because they don't act as an X-ray. So for example, um, in the black and white image, you can see um, how graves appear in a scan, right? You see all those, those little bumps um, and the tops of the coffins are identified with the white arrows. So you can see graves that are there and you know there are graves there, um, but you can't determine whose coffin is in each that spot. So it could be anybody's, right? You just know there's a coffin there. Um, so if she was inside, if she was in a grave or a graveyard or a church, um, where she was maybe the only grave or one of a few, um, then you can use GPR scans um, to find where those few graves exist in a specific area. So this is used a lot for unmarked grave and graveyards, um, right? Or when you're doing construction in a church and you're not sure where graves are under or how many there are, um, but you do that before you start. But again, it doesn't tell you the exact coffin and who owns that coffin. It just tells you that there are graves. So starting with that, um, once we learned more about UK burial laws, which that was fun reading through, um, um, and we learned that lead coffins, which um, of course are metal and are going to appear in these types of scans, um, had been buried inside the Minster from as early as the 14th century all the way up until 1861. So anybody who had some money and went to the Minster from the 14th century to 1861, um, um, people with money typically used a lead coffin. It did become required, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, 
all those people would be buried in there. So you're talking about a lot of coffins. Um, um, and then we also learned how the graves were constructed. Um, and so from all of that information, we realized that various types of surveys were not going to give us the answers we needed. Um, we already know there are graves in that church. We are pretty sure that she is inside that church um, and the church is filled with them. So going from there, we knew um, that we needed to continue to look elsewhere for, for actual evidence on where she might be. Um, two more points is that um, also when you, there, there's quite a few health hazards when dealing with exhuming bodies or exhuming graves and disinterment. Um, so you can't really just start digging and opening coffins like hoping you find somebody. So um, just a few bits. So coffins can explode from gases. Even later on, you can see an image of um, lead coffins on the slide. Um, those can actually pop open um, because they, they are airtight. So there are dangers there. Um, they can still spread disease when they do start popping open uh, or when you do open them. Um, so because of all this, we realized at this stage, uh, we needed to continue looking. Um, um, and that's what we did. So those are a few of the things that we've come across. So now let's move on to a little bit about how we work. So this group is distributed across four time zones within a seven hour window, which means we mostly work asynchronously. Uh, and there's always someone up looking into something. So to support that, we have a Discord server uh, that we use for rolling conversations and information sharing. And that's basically a never ending chat room. Uh, as well, we employ the same tools uh, that we use for other projects supported by Pact with Potential that you may already be familiar with. So that's mostly a shared Google Drive with documents and spreadsheets. And those help us catalog information, capture the developing story of what we find, and then elaborate questions that arise through that process. Um, as you would expect, this is a highly collaborative and hands-on effort. Uh, so it's both chaos and strictly organized, uh, but the reality is that it ebbs and flows um, as we uncover new things. Um, we also have you know, ad hoc Zoom meetings to re recap progress, uh, strategize next steps, and just brainstorm hypotheses based on new information that we uncover. So these are sometimes scheduled for an hour and go on for four. Uh, we are in a constant tug of war between you know, you know, our enthusiasm and drive to learn more and our availability and uh, commitments. Um, but it's being able to rely on the group to collectively make progress that allows this sort of emergent organic approach to fact finding to never really stop. Um, beyond that, like more philosophically, uh, we know that both accepting as well as rejecting hypothesis requires an open mind. Um, and that colors all our interactions, really. Um, Evidence-based research is not dry and prescriptive. It's actually highly creative. Uh, so when you have concrete new evidence, it grounds the next questions for the next set of answers that you will seek, uh, which can only be satisfied by finding new evidence. So it's really a virtuous cycle, if you will. Um, we talk a little bit about non-invasive and uh, uh, techniques, et cetera, because you know, consider the minster as you know, it's a building that serves the community. So leaning on evidence of most likely positive locations, et cetera, is sort of where we uh, focus our efforts so that we're not making assumptions like Chantel said, you know, there's no, there's no scenario in which it even makes sense to just start looking for someone like opening things up and looking for them in this sort of haphazard way. Um, and sometimes in the research, there are dead ends, um, no pun intended, I guess, uh, meaning we have to consider approaching the problem from a different angle than we started or seeking a different type of information. And it's really rarely a very linear process. So uh, some of us are closer to the physical archives and other resources of information. So shout out again to Drew Dobson, who is an integral part of this team and spends most of her waking time at the library. Uh, we're super grateful. Um, and overall, we make extensive use of online resources uh, to, to draw the information, do research, um, and look for references. So let's walk through some of the specific resources we've used and how we've used them. Uh, it's really diverse set of source materials from like a plethora of organizations and sources. So take it away, Chantel. Thanks. Um, so of course, when we first started asking all of these questions, and there are so many, our first thought was to the archives. Um, and so that is what we did. 
Um, so we started searching for pretty much anything and everything related to Ann Lister um, in this time area, time, time at before and after. Um, and of course, we even looked for things not related to Ann Lister because you never know where you're going to find something. So, um, and we started getting a lot of information. Um, so first we realized just how much we were gonna have. We started an archives order tracker and we started keeping track of every single thing that we would find in an archives that we needed to put our hands on and we needed to see and we needed to transcribe. Um, so we were tracking you know, what we found, where we found its importance and its priority um, and how we were going to obtain it. Um, because remember, while we were doing this, this was all happening during the pandemic. Um, everything was closed. Of course, Jude, there were a few times when, when things did open and she was able to go to the, to the library, which was perfect, um, but the archives were closed. Um, we did not, we had to um, rely on communicating with archivists virtually. Um, we had to order research time. Um, and of course, when we came across something, the only way to put eyes on it is we had to order it. Um, so, um, but the great thing is, is because most of these archives did stay open, we were able to continue our research through all this, which was so wonderful. So shout out to all the archives who did everything they did they could during this time um, to, to help people like us, um, especially uh, Jenny. <laughs> thank you from the bottom of my heart because um, you helped greatly in, in all of this. Um, so, um, you know, as we were doing this with the archives, so it was, <laughs> it was fun placing an order that wasn't cataloged. Um, 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 at the item level, right? So you just have like, oh, here's a bundle. Um, so we'd order something. And then of course the excitement of like, oh gosh, what are we gonna get? Let's start looking and transcribing, um, you know, cause again, you just never know. So um, the main area for this is we wanted to look at any journals um, that may contain mentions of funerals for details on locations, customs, um, anything that could help us answer our research questions. So we needed to know um, how the funerals and um, burials occurred so that we could know then where to look for even more information. Because remember, we were piecing together a story that only had a few pieces of information. Um, so, um, you know, we made our searches very broad and all over um, because as Sarah Rose pointed out the other day, you don't want to look for things to confirm your assumptions. You want to make sure you keep an open mind for any possibility. So that's what we did. And we searched why far and wide. Um, so correspondence was also really important in this research. Um, we've seen um, in other areas, people mention funerals in letters to, to people they're corresponding with. Um, so it would make sense that someone may have talked about Anne's funeral in the letter, right? So we started looking at um, um, possible connections there. We focused on acquaintances, friends, church correspondence um, during the time of Anne's death, um, as well as during the renovations. So there was a huge um, span of years where we were looking at, at, at correspondence. Um, um, a fun thing that I did find in this was... Um, uh, we ordered some Priestley correspondence because, you know, it could be assumed that Mr. Priestley was informed of Anne's funeral um, or he could have even attended it. Um, but one of the orders included his entire book catalog that contained all the books he donated to the, um, I believe, Halifax Antiquarian Society. Um, and I ended up like reading through it um, one evening um, and it is several pages. So I didn't think I'd be reading something like that for fun, but um, um, here we are. But you never know what's important. So the archives were, were a huge help. Okay, so um, this is a huge enterprise. So aside from the correspondence and the journals, what exactly uh, do you look at next? So, uh, well, all sorts of things like funerary uh, financial records, which provide additional context for stuff like who is the undertaker, uh, which bills were paid for coffin furniture, patterns uh, for funerals like the biscuits thing or the, the mutes the bearers, all that stuff. Uh, and we also used a, a time to get um, lithographs uh, of the church itself, because you want to see how the church changed over, the over time. So uh, being able to see the church in Anne's time is actually very, very valuable because you, you can then compare with uh, what is there today and see more or less what changed. So in that, that lithograph annotated that we have there, for example, if you look at it in yellow, there used to be a pulpit, a large pulpit there uh, in the middle aisle uh, next to a pillar. And today that pulpit doesn't exist. 
So the galleries on the North Isle used to be there too, and now there are no galleries there. So basically you get uh, to travel back in time. And we did this uh, for different materials to have an idea of what exactly uh, might have changed. And then we carefully annotate exactly what changed so we can keep track of it. Okay, moving on. Okay, so another thing we used were, as I mentioned before, seating plans. So the, the big plan you see there is actually the first one we came across that was attributed to, be, to belonging to Anne Lister. And we are uh, allowed to reproduce here with permission from the West Yorkshire Archive Service. So thank you guys. Um, one thing we did, as I mentioned before, is that we did some image processing on, on the, these plants to read what was there in the, the, no, uh, the, the pencil notes. And um, that's how we can now read what's written under those graves of the Lister vault, which are actually the graves of Joseph Lister. J James Lister uh, and Jeremy Lister. Uh, you will recall that uh, and, and, um, Joseph Lister's second wife is buried with him and Aunt Anne is buried with James Lister. So they are basically occupying also those graves. Um, and, and I have a funny story about the plan. Uh, one night we were talking about church plans and in this enterprise of getting more and more church plans, we ended up looking at an online archive that had a plan for um, St. John the Baptist in Halifax. And we're like, oh, cool, this is the Halifax Parish Church. Well, as it turns out, there is another St. Uh, John the Baptist in the wilderness in Crag Vale. So wrong plan, fellows. We had to go back and everybody had a laugh but it was 2 a.m. and we had been looking at the same plan of the wrong church for about an hour and trying to figure out how is that going to work? Well, it doesn't work. So another funny one, moving on. Um, so identifying where the Lister Vault in the church was only part of the process for identifying uh, where Anne could have been buried. So obviously some of the plans, you know, uh, that she wrote on in pencil <laughs> were annotated with who was in there, Nobody did that for her that we've been able to find, uh, at least thus far. So um, we needed to know more about which of her family members would have also been interred in the vault and to have an idea of how much room would have been available by 1840 when Anne died. So that involves getting out the Lister pedigree, building a family tree, um, which there's just an excerpt of that provided here. Uh, believe me, it's very extensive. <laughs> um, but then also using that and using burial and death records to um, then find the dates for, for those that were deceased and, um, and looking for supportive material from around that time, including newspaper clippings, um, as Chantal mentioned, journals, correspondence that would have maybe mentioned those funerals to find additional information um, about any details that could help us. So to, to narrow down potential burial locations by process of elimination, we kind of started working backwards using family funerals that Anne herself attended and recorded in the journal because of course, as we know, she's so thorough that she would of course be the most detailed firsthand witness that, that we uh, could rely upon to find, find any of that kind of excruciating detail about funerals. So um, an example uh, from 1836 that um, supported what Marlene was just saying that we know Uncle James and Aunt Anne were buried in the same uh, grave is that Anne wrote in her journal, or, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead of myself. The 1836 is Jeremy's funeral, <laughs> and she wrote that the grave um, took up the whole breadth of the aisle and that it was deep enough for two coffins above my father's. Um, and I, I think I mixed my, my quotes up from the from the two entries. I apologize about that. When Aunt Anne passed away a few months after her father, she was laid in the same vault as Uncle James, not in the vault with Jeremy, is what I was trying to get at. Um, the second excerpt on the slide there um, from Anne's journal also shows an example of her brother John's coffin being placed upon her Aunt Martha's in uh, another more direct example, like the comment about Jeremy's having two spaces above it that indicates the stacking of coffins within a vault, which is a process um, you'll hear Chantel talk more about later. But we can advance to the next slide. As you can imagine, this opened up another layer 
pardon the pun, <laughs> of, of tracking that needed to be done. Um, in the entry about her, in another entry about her father's funeral, um, Anne mentioned that the place he was to be buried was neighboring another that belonged to the Ramsdens of Wellhead. Um, Anne also commented that the last two Ramsden internments in those graves had occurred 70 and 80 years prior to 1836, respectively. Um, this kind of information was then able to be cross-referenced with other parish death and burial records, but another extremely valuable resource uh, was a book by E.W. Crossley that Amanda spent a lot of time with, so I'll let her tell you more about that. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, I did certainly spend a lot of time with this book. So E.W. Crossley's book, The Monument, um, the Monumental and Other Inscriptions in Halifax Parish Church, was published, it published in uh, 1909. Um, and contains not only the work of Cross Crossley himself, but that of E.J. Walker, C.J. Walker, and S.T. Reig, um, all of whom were local amateur historians and antiquari antiquarians um, with a special interest in documenting the monuments and tombstone inscriptions um, in the Halifax Parish Church. Um, this was all done during the 19th century. Um, and given the huge amount of information uh, that's contained within this book, we decided to transcribe this book into a spreadsheet because we love spreadsheets. Um, so we did this with a good purpose, not just because we love spreadsheets. Uh, we did this to, in order to understand the position um, of these inscriptions on the floor of the Halifax Press Church. Um, and you can see that lovely gift there in this slide that shows you all the, all the separate columns that we, that we put them into and then color coded them according to family name, um, which was very useful. Um, this allowed us to visually see in the columns um, how these stones were laid out in the aisles, cross aisles, and the various areas within the church. This exercise highlighted and corroborated a number of things to us. Firstly, it confirmed that stones within the church were moved over the years. Uh, the various footnotes within Crossley's book refer to the stones that were previously seen in other parts of the church, but were now positioned elsewhere. Additionally, some of the footnotes say that the, only a portion of the stone is visible due to it being cut off. Uh, one example of a stone being moved is one that belonged to a Walker family, and it was recorded by Crossley as being in the East Cross Isle, but the footnote in the book reads, this stone was formerly in the South Isle of the chancel, which had been recorded in Walker's manuscript uh, that Crossley had included in his book. Uh, the top part had been cut off. Secondly, it corroborated what Anne's journal uh, entry of the 5th of April 1836 says, as you can see on the slide, um, the, list of, the listers buried in the church who were related to Anne, because there were other listers uh, buried in the church who were not related to the Lister family that, that we care about, um, are indeed located two stones there below alongside graves belonging to the Ramsons of Wellhead. And if you have a look at the smaller image at the top next to that quote, you can see that the, the red graves that we have um, highlighted or the red inscriptions we've highlighted all belong to the listers and next to them are the blue graves belonging to the Ramsons of Wellhead. These graves were recorded by Crossley as being positioned in the south aisle of the church and not in the Holsworth Chapel, which had previously been thought to be the location of the Lister vault. You're, you're muted, shit. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> One of the other um, um, areas that we focused on, um, of course, we had to know um, the local history. Um, so, um, and that included the funerary customs and burial practices at the time, right? So, um, um, and notice we've got some examples on, on the screen of sort of like the things that we were discovering with this. Um, so with the funerary customs, right? We needed to, when we're thinking about what might be under that ground um, and how they put coffins into the ground and what they did with all this, we needed to know um, what kind of coffin types were used. Um, how were those coffins constructed? Um, because in this research, we were able, we were also able to connect to other references describing funerals, right? Of like, oh, okay, that makes sense um, um, with the construction of the graves. So as you'll notice in the um, picture um, on the left with um, the rectangular single grave, 
Um, so there are, there are several different types of graves and how they're constructed. So kind of like what we mentioned the vault earlier. So a vault is used for multiple, um, uh, generally speaking, but Ann Lister explains in detail about how things were brick lined and, and describes how these actual um, graves look. So um, we did a lot of research, um, read a lot of articles on, like you see there, constructing the grave, competing burial ideas in 19th century England um, to try and piece together these things. Um, so you'll see there as a brick lined grave, uh, they would brick um, line the grave so that it wouldn't collapse and they nicely layer the coffins down in there. Um, we also, um, uh, with those grave constructions, there are also other burial practices that they do. Um, um, they mention things about, you know, decorating it and it looks nice. So we had to go down that whole route to kind of piece together what these things looked like. Um, and you'll notice in that quote there, um, um, owing to the weight or large size of the coffin, there was some difficulty in lowering it into the vault um, or grave bricked round. Um, Another good example of not every single word is literal when Ann Lister's writing. So um, it's not necessarily a round grave, but it is bricked um, around. Um, and she goes on to say it was requisite to move another flag in the aisle and the service proceeded. Um, so that is what you see as that brick lined grave. Um, and that makes a difference, especially when we were looking at the technology side of things. Um, if we're going to be looking underground, like, OK, so that's one of the things that are underground. But then you'll see the black and white picture. So this is another example of another church that they um, they were, um, I'm sorry, I can't believe if they were like demolishing the church and this was part of the, the, the process. Um, but this is after the walls and the floor has been removed. And you can see, one, it's very similar to how um, the Halifax Minster is shaped, but look at all those brick lined graves. And so over the hundreds of years of people being buried, each of those would have had people stacked on top of each other. Um, some of those could be as deep as 20 feet. Um, some of them could be as shallow as just for a couple. So um, you're talking about all of that under those floors, um, <laughs> trying to find um, where Anne might be. So that local history of that kind of stuff was really important for us to go into. Okay, so um, one challenge we had was that there is a lot of information about the church and the, the history of the church, but uh, the, the detail, the level of detail never went quite to what we needed. So it became necessary to assemble um, the most complete history of the Halifax Parish Church um, possible, which means that you have to go to all this scattered information and then collate that in a way that makes sense. So you can follow it uh, on a timeline or something of the sort, and then know wh where to navigate to get the information you need. So a lot of material available uh, in uh, local history publications, books, guides, pamphlets, mostly focuses on the same highlights, either uh, periods that connect directly to the history of the, the town itself or bits that are relevant to the features that you can see today on the church. So we went through many, many, many history books, both um, old and new. I have one here that is from 1836. And the most recent one I have, I think it's from 2019. So we went over a great amount of information to have uh, a bird's eye view of what changed, when, who was on top of it, and then we collated all that. But sometimes you need to go further, uh, and that's where newspapers go in. Everybody laughs because newspapers are not always super accurate, uh, but when five or six newspapers complain of the same thing and they are not um, copying the same article, you start to think perhaps they know something that we don't. After all, they were there. So. Searching through old books and historical writing uh, allowed us to understand how things change around the building and how it serves the community back then at those specific times. Uh, but context is important. So uh, we started with the uh, local history of the town itself. And in this, in this part of our research, uh, one of the books that helped immensely was uh, T.W. Anson's The Story of Old Halifax. It's meant to be a, a sort of a children's book, and you would probably laugh at it. But this book is actually very comprehensive. And from there, we could branch out um, into other more uh, compl uh, complex books about the same local history, uh, because 
This is like a crash course into the history of Halifax itself. And then you can follow up with works by uh, Crabtree, Turner, Hargrave, uh, Hargraves, uh, which is one of the most recent books we have. And of course, when you need to read a period uh, literature or uh, memories of old figures like Reverend Pigou, you have a baseline that you can use to know exactly what they are navigating at each point in time. So uh, most of the local history you come across in basic information is modern or, as I said, connected to the features of the church itself. But then you have stuff like uh, Reverend Pigou's memoirs, which report on his time in Halifax and he briefly mentions the renovations of the church in 1878, which he was at the helm of, and uh, he was quite proud about uh, that. And he also mentions the bodies uh, on the floors and the problems they had with uh, the state in which the church uh, was at the time it took over. And of course, we are very indebted to the old and new researchers of the Halifax Antiquarian Society, for their amazing work on specific pieces of research, both about the, the history of the town itself, but of the history of the church. Sometimes articles about stuff like coats of arms bring information that we don't uh, find elsewhere. So we are obviously standing on the shoulders of giants, both uh, old and new. So um, when we worked with the plans of the church itself, we started to assemble re resources like what you see on the screen now, which is a GIF of a, compo of a composite uh, being assembled with the information we gathered from different plans. So this allows us to see how the, bu the building changes over time. And then we can uh, go back and uh, check if a change was in place or not. So this is always super helpful. Now, moving on. So, <laughs> the um, academic research and references. So, um, I swore after I finished school that I was not going to look at another academic article again, um, but Ann Lister brought them all flying um, back into my daily life. Um, so, we went through countless numbers of um, journals and reference articles and case studies for um, for this. Um, so um, as you can see on screen, um, we've got some examples. We we went through all of the technical reports for the case studies on the GPR surveys that, that had been done in the United States and in Europe um, on different graveyards. Um, we wanted to know as much as we possibly could about all that background information. Um, again, we had to know all about the UK laws and requirements, and there's multiple studies on those. Um, we also had to go into some photography expeditions where we were comparing old, um, um, old images and lithographs to um, newer images. Um, there have been several uh, different types of renovations in the Minster, and you can find various images and or videos of different, um, different portions of these. So taking those pictures, um, comparing them, collating them, seeing how those changed um, was, was, was another important piece of this. Um, and then, of course, there are articles out there describing all this, but the um, the um, academic journals and the references that um, we ended up reading was quite intensive and it was it was a lot of fun to like say oh my gosh look what I just found um, in this journal article. Um, so yeah, very important for this. And one more note. So we even went as far as to when we first started um, looking into the um, potential technologies. So one of the things that you need to know, um, of course, is what the ground is like. So I even um, I did some research into the types of soil in Halifax, um, the um, type, you know, what was actually under the Minster um, construction wise before graves were put in um, to know how that could also affect um, any of these things that we were looking at. So um, this piece, this piece was, was a lot um, between all of us. All right, well, at this point, you may be wondering what's next. Uh, and we can confidently say there is more to come. Um, this has been an ongoing discovery process for quite some time. Uh, and I last night I decided to check how long it had been since we started. And coincidentally, unpredictably, 
it was exactly one year ago today that we started this work. So we were all surprised by that as well. Um, it was a question in our collective minds for a long time. So that's when we started to really dig in, I suppose. Um, and while we could not have anticipated, we'll still be working on it uh, a year in. Uh, where is and Lister is a powerful question because it demands a precise answer. Um, so we have been exploring some new information and seeking some supporting evidence for it. Uh, and we'll share more soon. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we can take some questions now. Let's see. Um, there are so many good questions. Would anybody like to unmute and ask a question? I can um, take a look. One second. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all. Uh, Sal Lindsay had a good question earlier, or a whole block of questions. Uh, you want to unmute yourself and ask us one of those? Um, if not, I, I can read what she put. So yeah, go for uh, it. Lindsay, Lindsay Lance, um, thank you for these questions that you added. So these vaults being so unstandardized, um, when would they have been constructed? Were any dug and lined prior to the churches being built? Um, those dug and lined later, did the family pre-purchase a certain depth for a certain amount of money? And did coffins ever get pulled up to enlarge the vaults deeper? Good, awesome questions. Um, so there are tons of answers to those, but while there was a custom that sort of standardized, there wasn't really um, hard and set rules like where there would be today's, right? They could sort of skirt around some of these things. So they would sell these um, burial graves. Um, as you saw in that one um, quote, they had to use some of the Ransom scrape to fit. So there was, um, you know, some gray areas where they were where they were working around in this. But you can see from that black and white picture we shared that it does become sort of haphazard because over the years they're having to, you know, reline these bricked graves. Some of them are vaults that are under the ground. Um, so that's why this is so difficult because it's not so perfectly standardized and like what you might find today. It's sort of all over the place and you got to piece it back together. And I don't know if if I had the full um, entry from that excerpt about in, encroaching on the Ramsden grave on the slide, but part of that entry in the journal, um, uh, and I think it's it's listed um, in more detail in the, in the article itself, uh, discusses that Anne, while she's visiting with the sexton, is talking about how they need to steal about two feet from their neighbor's grave. So that's what Chantel is referring to. Uh, was there a question about um, archive materials that were not digitized? I'm trying to find it again. I know that there was something. Okay. Oh, once an item, letter, etc., is digitized, is it made available by uh, YAS online? Is there a difference in ordering material that has not yet been digitized and material that has already been digitized? Um, I'll let you take that one, Chantel. Um, yeah, uh, so anything that hasn't been digitized and that's open to the public um, has potential comp copyright implications. So the reasons why you have to place that order um, and ask for permission to share it is because there, there, there could be those copyright rules and they might not be able to make it public. So um, like when we ordered something, they wouldn't automatically then make it available to the public. So anybody else who would want it would need to order it again and get their own copy. So- um, and, when, and when we're saying copies too, those are a lot of times just photographs, like a digital picture that we can be um, emailed in this case, as we were discussing that the archives are closed and so we're doing all of this digitally. Um, but that's not the same kind of scan that an archive would do if they were going to uh, make a, a high definition, you know, quality image of that record available online. As a funny anecdote, when we came across the 1836 plans, we had to ask Jenny to get photos closer to the, the pencil marks because we knew the marks were there, but we, we couldn't read it. So Jenny had to suffer through the process of trying to focus the camera on very small and very faint um, pencil notes that we could then read or edit the image in a way that we can actually read them better. So first Jenny suffered through that. And when we told Jude, hey, have a look and see what you can uh, come across, 
she had to reproduce the same process and focus the camera again and well they suffered through that so sometimes that happens sometimes you are going over a scan that is not super clear and you need to order a specific copy with focus on that area sometimes you need to apply um well some some tools of, of for photography to to read what's there to enhance colors all that stuff but uh, it's a process there was a go ahead Oh, I was going to say, there's another good question about if coffins can be stacked, is there information on whether all coffins or burials were moved or if they only move a top layer? And it might be good um, to go into the point of Marlene, you spoke about earlier that um, um, they did have permission to move what they needed to, but we have no record of what they might have moved. <laughs> yeah, so um, when you need to make cha changes on a church, a vicar can authorize them, but when it's a big thing or a specific thing, uh, you need to ask permission from the church itself, which is done by way of applying to, to get um, a document called the faculty, which must be approved by the church. Uh, in 1878, there was uh, a faculty, actually approved some years early, if I recall correctly, that was approved for the renovations. And then among uh, several things, it authorizes the type of work that they are allowed to do, what they can touch, and also what do you do uh, when you need to move human remains because they knew of those that were visible and caused that bad smell. So there was an authorization to move if necessary. It doesn't mean that they did or did not. It just gives them the permission to do it if necessary to move those remains to consecration, uh, consecrated ground, and the same uh, ceremonies and uh, respect must be observed during reburial. So that's as much as we know at this moment. They were yes. authorized. It doesn't necessarily mean that they did or didn't. Steph? All right. Uh, so what I was going to add is that you know, also consider that this is like a longitudinal problem. Like all these rules that Marlene just described are right now rules. So, you know, if we're looking at what might have happened in a similar circumstance, you know, 50, 90 years ago, those rules were not the same or enforced in the same way. So we also have to like, every time we're considering a transition point where there's a renovation or something, uh, what were the boundaries there of those rules and how that may have affected the choices as they made at the time. And that also informs what kind of records they would have kept or not kept based on what those rules were. Um, I see a question. Uh, would her casket set her apart from the regular casket? Possibly, but you probably see that distinction visually. But if you're seeing the distinction visually, you already found it. So it's a sort of a lesser, um, lesser useful information. Um, but I don't know if anyone wanted to add anything to that. That's actually one interesting question, because uh, when we started, there was all sorts of information about the coffin and all that, uh, that stuff. And then we decided to start with a, a simple baseline. What do we know for sure about this coffin? So what we knew for sure is that uh, what's uh, said in the newspaper, it was heavy, hard to move, and that's about it. And it was allegedly adorned with the coat of arms and that's it. Nothing about materials, nothing about uh, layers because coffins can have layers, uh, nothing more than that. So the lead coffin thing is actually a very safe bet because that's the law. You can't bury people inside the church at that time without a lead coffin. That is a fairly safe thing. But what, when you start to think about what you actually know or don't know, things start to get tricky. And then when you consider how the other coffins in the church would look like or, or the sizes. And for example, uh, when Jeremy Lister was buried, his coffin barely uh, made uh, the space of the south aisle. But James Lister only uses about half of that. And then Lister says the coffin was big. So... You can't just look at the floor as it is and say, oh, maybe this is the size. No, you can't say that. Even with the GPR scan, you know, you know there's a disturbance, but you don't know more. You don't know who is there. You don't know exactly what is causing the disturbance. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the best way to know is to dig, but the building is in use and we do not advocate um, disturbing a building that is used and, and useful for the community for such a futile uh, uh, reason so there is that respect that comes with this work 
All right, uh, we are going over. So I'm going to take the last question uh, from uh, Veronica Lesnakova. Um, all of you have full-time jobs, right? When do you have time to do all of this in-depth research? I think, Amanda, uh, would you like to comment on? Yeah. I, I really don't know. <laughs> Somehow we have managed to shoehorn this into everything else that we do, but um, it helps that we do cover, you know, quite a few time zones. So like Liv said at the start of this uh, session, we there's always somebody working on something, um, which is useful, but that means that, you know, you wake up in my time zone with like 200 messages to catch up on. So that takes the first like half an hour, hour of the day. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's a collective, Every, everything is shared, everything does what they, are, what they can manage. Um, and, you know, every contribution is, is valid. Um, so yeah, we just, we just do what we can. Yeah, just, just the last thing I wanted to add to that is that that also dictates the pace that we can or cannot move. Like if we're not available and we have commitments, then it's going to wait. Or if we need to take a break because we've done too much too fast, then we should do that too. And there is no external pressure um, to, to do that. But uh, the internal pressure is intense enough. So it never, <laughs> never results in a slowdown, it turns out. And for All this, right. because we okay. got so excited, we did, yeah, when we when we first started until we released it, it was that eight weeks. So we definitely um, had some burnout after that. Yeah, the first eight weeks were a little too intense, uh, but we're finding a better pace over time. But uh, yeah. Then the plans hit and then you have to go another week or two <laughs> rushing everything. Did, did I understand you correctly that one of your theories is that she's buried in the Walker family area because Anne would have arranged the burial and Walker would have arranged the burial. Did I understand that correctly as one of your theories or not? Look, right now that's a possibility we have on the table. Nothing has come up to prove or disprove, but obviously there are other more um, likely theories uh, we have on the article. So basically what we do is we discard information as more information that comes to either uh, prove or disprove. So that is unlikely, but it's not something we can't uh, discard at this point in time, though there are other options that we consider are more likely than that one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much. This has been really fun. Uh, and uh, this concludes this session. And now it's time for us all to get together and party. So we'll see you in a little bit. Bye.